Today we have some more actual history from the early days of the American Republic, during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson, as well as James Madison. We will hear the story of one of America's great early explorers and generals, Zebulon Montgomery Pike. We will be reading from this book, The Story of Colorado, Out Where the West Begins, by Arthur Chapman. This book was published all the way back in 1924. So this story is going to start off by providing a brief history of the United States just after the turn of the 19th century. We will hear about the Louisiana Purchase and about Pike's 1806 expedition to present-day Colorado and New Mexico. This expedition complemented that of Lewis and Clark, who traveled to the Northwest. We will also hear about the tragic early end of Pike's life during the War of 1812. So here is the story of General Pike and his discovery of the peak that now bears his name. In the fall of 1806, two parties of daring American explorers bound in opposite directions received word of each other. Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, on their way down the Missouri, after having reached the Pacific by way of Oregon, heard of the sending of Lieutenant Zebulon Montgomery Pike to explore the headwaters of the Arkansas and Rio Grande Rivers in the present Colorado. Pike, then on the Osage River, on his way west on one of the strangest yet most brilliant ventures in American exploration, heard of the safe homecoming of the Lewis and Clark expedition, and of the successful penetration of the far corners of the Louisiana Purchase. But before these explorers were sent to bring back the first word that was to give form and substance to a land which hitherto had been regarded as a hopeless wilderness, certain important political moves had been made by Spain, France, and the United States, these moves affecting the future of Colorado. Spain, as the possessor of New Orleans, held the keys to transportation on the Mississippi River. For years there were many short-sighted persons who thought that river transportation would never amount to anything, but the pioneers who fought their way through the dense forests of the Midwest and established their farms and plantations in the Mississippi Valley soon created a commerce which was so promising that none could ignore it. Finally, the Spanish authorities at New Orleans closed that port to the American traders from up the river. Disregarding appeals to drive the Spaniards out of the Mississippi River country, which could easily have been done, President Jefferson sought a peaceful way out of the difficulty. He admitted that the open spaces on the map of our continent teased him. He felt that those open spaces claimed by foreign countries but lying undeveloped should belong to the United States, which nation alone could make the fullest use of them. So when it was learned under the terms of one of the many secret treaties by which the European nations carried on their affairs, Louisiana had passed from the control of Spain to that of France, Jefferson sought through our minister Robert R. Livingston to open negotiations for the purchase of New Orleans. Some historians say that Jefferson had at first no idea of buying the great territory which he eventually secured for the United States, but it is probable that he saw Napoleon's straits, and realized that it would be to the best interests of that ruler to surrender his ambitions, so far as this continent was concerned, and to yield the French possessions here to the United States. Napoleon was not long in reaching that point of view. At first, he had announced great plans for the strengthening of France through building up a wonderful colony in Louisiana. Then he saw that he was in a bad strategical position. He knew that England was supreme at sea, and he could not hope to hold Louisiana in a case of war. The greater the possessions of France in the Western Hemisphere, the greater the French loss when England chose to strike. So Napoleon, through his minister Talleyrand, asked what the United States government would give not only for New Orleans, but for the entire territory of Louisiana. There is not space to give the details of the Louisiana Purchase. Suffice it to say that the purchase was soon made, the United States buying for $15 million a territory so vast that even the boundaries were in doubt. In fact, Napoleon, with characteristic cunning, left the boundaries vague as a safeguard and also because defining them exactly would take too much time. When the treaty was signed, Napoleon said, I have by this act made the United States so great that that nation will sometime humble the pride of England. Thus in three weeks was the area of the United States doubled. Thomas Jefferson had secured those blank spaces on the map which had teased him. Now what did he intend to do with them? Jefferson's answer to those persons who heaped reproaches upon him for buying a desert was to send Lewis and Clark to explore Oregon. 
Their report alone was enough to justify the purchase. Meantime, Lieutenant Zebulon M. Pike enters upon the scene, bringing with him something of an element of mystery which time has done little to clear. The mystery comes in Pike's connection with General Wilkinson, then in command of the United States Army. Wilkinson was a partner in Burr's schemes of traitorous conquest. Just what Burr's plans were has never been fully established. Some historians say that he intended to put himself on the throne in Mexico, and then seize the possessions of Spain on this side of the Rio Grande. Others say he intended to establish a rival republic in Texas. Jefferson said that Burr's crimes had been sown from Maine through the whole line of western waters to New Orleans. When he was vice president, Burr had killed Alexander Hamilton in a duel. He was indicted after his term of office and fled. When the indictment reached him, it is said that he had war supplies on his boat, on the Mississippi River, ready for carrying out whatever dark scheme had been in his mind. General Wilkinson, who at last turned informer on Burr, and who also had been a paid spy in the employ of Spain, sent Lieutenant Pike on an expedition to the Rocky Mountains, ostensibly to negotiate treaties with the Indians and to take to their homes a band of Osages held captives by the Potawatomis of Iowa, and to secure sufficient knowledge of the southeastern boundary of Louisiana to enable our government to enter definitely into an arrangement for a line of demarcation between that territory and New Mexico. He had previously sent Pike on an expedition to the headwaters of the Mississippi. Pike is one of the brave and interesting figures among Western explorers. Boldness was his to the fine point of foolhardiness. Surveying the wintry prospect of the Rocky Mountains from the plains, he was not dismayed. With a hardihood which nearly brought him to death, he toiled into the snows of the unknown Rockies. Though he and his men had only cotton clothing and depended for food on what they could kill from day to day, only the merest chance saved him and his overall clad men from death amid the snows at Timberline. Pike started up the Missouri River from the vicinity of St. Louis on July 15, 1806. There were 23 men in his party, which seems to have been poorly provided with supplies, something which is not to be wondered at when one finds that General Wilkinson allowed only $600 for outfitting the expedition. Pike and others in his party began at once to supply game for food, deer or fowl being shot at every stop on the Missouri and Osage rivers. Pike's skill with firearms was proved when a shooting match was held, while the party was encamped on the Osage. Pike won the prize, a jacket and a twist of tobacco. Pike says, I made the articles, however, a present to the young fellow who waited on me. Six weeks were spent in proceeding up the Missouri and Osage to a point near the Osage village, where the captives were returned to their tribespeople. Here Pike secured horses and marched southward, through a country black with buffalo, to the Arkansas River which was reached on October 14th. A lieutenant was sent back by canoe with letters for General Wilkinson, and Pike and the remainder of his party proceeded toward the Mexican mountains, now called the Rocky Mountain Range, the first sight of which was greeted with cheers on November 15th. The first mountain sighted, which, as Pike reports, looked like a blue cloud, was the great peak which later was to bear the explorer's name. Pike reached the site of the present city of Pueblo on November 23rd, and here he built a small fort of logs, no trace of which was ever discovered by later parties. He resolved to climb the Blue Mountain, now known as Pike's Peak, in order to lay down from its high pinnacle the various and sundry positions of the country. Pike marched early on November 25th, expecting to climb the mountain the same day but he was only able to reach the base of Cheyenne Mountain, one of the flanking peaks. Expecting to return to our camp the same evening, writes the explorer, who was unused to the deceptive distances in the rarefied western atmosphere, we left all our blankets and provisions at the foot of Cheyenne Mountain. Pike's party camped for the night in a cave part way up the mountain. On the mountainside they found deer and pheasant and bison. The explorers, hungry and extremely sore from the inequality of the rocks on which we had lain all night, as Pike puts it, were amply compensated for our toil by the sublimity of the prospect below. The unbounded prairie was overhung with clouds, which appeared like the ocean in a storm, wave piled on wave and foaming, while the sky was perfectly clear where we were. 
The party reached the summit of Cheyenne Mountain at noon and found themselves waist deep in a snowstorm, with the main peak still to be climbed. It is often said that Pike declared the Great Peak could never be climbed, whereas now it is conquered on foot by thousands of tourists each season, not to mention those who ascended in the saddle or by automobile or cog railroad. Pike did not make such a sweeping statement. What he said of the Grand Peak was, it was as high again as what we had ascended, and it would have taken a whole day's march to arrive at its base, when I believe no human being could have ascended to its pinnacle. Inasmuch as this was late in November in the midst of a severe snowstorm, with a thermometer registering 9 degrees below zero, and with explorers thinly clad with light overalls and no stockings, and with no food and no prospect of killing any game, Pike was justified in his belief that under such circumstances the peak could not be climbed. Continuing up the Arkansas River, after returning to the camp on the side of Pueblo, the party experienced great hardships in a long-continued storm with bitterly cold weather. The men had no winter clothing and Pike himself wore cotton overalls, for he says, I had not calculated on being out at that inclement season of the year. Pike and Dr. Robinson took the altitude of the Grand Peak and figured it at 18,581 feet, whereas its actual height above sea level, as afterward established, is 14,109 feet. Proceeding up the river to the site of the present Canyon City, Pike and his party penetrated a short distance into the Royal Gorge, which they found impassable, but which now is traversed by the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad. For more than a month under the most trying circumstances, Pike and his men wandered about in the mountains, trying to find the source of the Red River. They also looked for Spaniards whose camps had been found, and who had afterward developed were looking for Pike. One of Pike's discoveries after he crossed the ridge dividing the Arkansas and Missouri waters was part of the headwaters of the South Platte, in what is now known as South Park. After more wandering and more suffering, Pike and the doctor and eleven men crossed the summit of the Sangre de Cristo Range into San Luis Valley, where they built a log fort at the junction of the Rio Grande and the Canejos Rivers. From here, Pike sent Dr. Robinson to Santa Fe to collect a bill against one Baptiste Leland, a trader supposed to be one of the first white men to enter Colorado, who had fled to New Mexico with all his employer's funds. It is held by historians that this was a mere pretext, and that Dr. Robinson was in reality a spy, his business being to find out all that he could about the Spanish possessions in the Southwest. This is one of the many mysteries about the Pike expedition, which time has never cleared up. Pike and those with him at the fort were visited by a troop of Spanish cavalry sent by the governor of New Mexico. On being told that he was in Spanish territory, Pike lowered the American flag, and he and his men were taken to Santa Fe. Pike was courteously received by the Spanish governor. Some of Pike's men, whose feet were badly frozen and who had been left in camp on the other side of the mountains in Colorado, were brought to Santa Fe by the Spaniards. Pike and his party of men were sent to El Paso and thence to Chihuahua, Mexico, from there being brought northward again and released on July 1, 1807. Pike's maps were lost, so his trail is difficult to follow. Pike was born in Trenton, New Jersey on January 5, 1779. His father, Zebulon Pike, had been a captain in the Revolutionary Army. Young Pike entered the Army when he was 15 years old. At the time he was chosen by General Wilkinson to explore the headwaters of the Mississippi, he was a first lieutenant and 23 years old. Less than a year after his return from Mexico, he became a major, and thence rose step by step until he was appointed Brigadier General in 1813. But before this appointment had been confirmed, General Pike was killed at the head of his troops in the successful assault on York, now Toronto, Canada, on April 27, 1813. The retreating British exploded their powder magazine just as the Americans came up. A heavy stone struck General Pike in the back, inflicting injuries from which he died a few hours later, but not until he had been assured of the victory of his men. The British flag was brought to him, and he made a sign to have it put under his head just before he died. The entire nation joined in the mourning of the loss of General Pike. 
A resolution of respect was introduced in Congress, and a battleship was named for him. But the greatest monument of all was to be the Grand Peak, which the explorer had viewed from the banks of the Arkansas at the borders of the Colorado of today. With characteristic modesty, Pike had refrained from naming the mountain for himself, or for anyone else in his party. The mountain was at first officially named James Peak, but the trappers and traders along the Arkansas River insisted on calling it Pike's Peak. After Pike's trip of exploration, Colorado seems to have lain almost forgotten for ten years or more. The Midwest absorbed most of the immigration. On the plains of eastern Colorado, the bison and deer and other wild game roamed in profusion, their only human enemies being the Indians. Many Indian trails led to the bubbling springs which we now know as Manitow, but of white men there were none to drink those sparkling waters, or to climb the marvelous heights that so enraptured young Pike. Then came the Spanish Treaty of 1819, ceding Florida to the United States and defining the Spanish boundaries in the southwest. By this treaty, the boundary between the United States and the Spanish possessions in Colorado was made the Arkansas River. So that's it for this story from Arthur Chapman's book, The Story of Colorado, Out Where the West Begins. Chapman did not go into much detail about Pike's death at the Battle of York. To give a better picture of this important event in the War of 1812, I am now going to read a section from this article that was published in 1949 in the journal New York History, Zebulon Montgomery Pike and the York Campaign, 1813. This was written by W.E. Holland. Meanwhile, Pike was breveted Inspector General of the Northern Army and appointed commander of Fort Tompkins. He set up his headquarters in one of the blockhouses and, with characteristic energy, prepared for the coming campaign. Later, he was appointed to Brigadier General. Although Pike had worked hard to earn his new rank, it is doubtful if he would have received it had it not been for the indolence of General Dearborn. This officer, instructed to lead the advance into Canada, had pretended illness, Later, Dearborn was to claim for himself much of the credit of this successful campaign. More than 4,000 troops, including several companies of Marines, had been assembled at Sackett's Harbor by the end of March. They were to cross Lake Ontario and assault York as soon as the ice broke, with Pike's 1st Brigade leading the attack. This rather miscellaneous unit of 1,700 men embraced the 6th, 15th, and 16th regiments, a company of light artillery, one company of the 14th and another of the 21st regiments, Forsyth's Rifle Corps, a company of volunteers from New York, and another from Baltimore. York, the present Toronto, had now been chosen instead of Kingston as the first objective, because it was thought to be less heavily fortified. It was the seat of government of Upper Canada, and was about the size of Sackett's Harbor. Isaac Chauncey, who had insisted upon the final blow at York, was to get the men across in a naval squadron under his command. By April 20th, the ice had melted enough to let the unit sail. The troops were to embark in 13 vessels, one of them the newly completed Madison a sister ship of the General Pike, which was still under construction at Sackett's Harbor and not yet named in the General's honor. Before embarking, Pike had personally worked out the plan of attack. His orders were given to each field officer who in turn was to read them carefully to his own corps. Personal property was to be respected and plundering forbidden. The General confidently hopes that the blood of an unresisting or yielding enemy will never stain the weapons of the soldiers of his column. To his father, Pike wrote, I embark tomorrow in the fleet at Sackett's Harbor at the head of 1,500 choice troops on a secret expedition. If success attends my steps, honor and glory await my name. If defeat, still shall it be said that we died like brave men, and conferred honor even in death on the American name. The squadron sailed on April 23rd and three days later anchored offshore opposite York. An unexpected storm had delayed the attack one day, and because of adverse winds, the fleet was unable to approach nearer than a mile and a half below the town and half a mile offshore. At 7 o'clock on the morning of April 27th, the first landing craft embarking parts of the 15th and 16th Infantry and all of Forsyth's rifles started for shore. The landing was not unlike a modern amphibious operation. Naval vessels first laid down a barrage, to be followed by a wave of small boats, which discharged their men and returned to the ships for more. 
Some of the smaller craft hit by shore batteries capsized in the water, but most accomplished their mission safely. Enemy riflemen at the water's edge fired on our troops as they disembarked, but as more Americans came on, they stormed the beach with fixed bayonets, driving the defenders back to the woods into which they now pursued them. General Pike, among the first to land, urged on his men. Among the defenders, the many Indian contingents were now utterly demoralized. Too much Yankee! Too much Yankee! they cried, throwing down their arms and fleeing in all directions. Pushing on toward the town, the Americans overran enemy batteries one after another, taking some almost without resistance. Meantime, the ships offshore had concentrated their fire upon the fort, guarding the town while Pike and his men advanced to within 400 yards of its wall. There he halted on the edge of a clearing so that his troops might bring up artillery. General R. H. Sheaf, the British commander at York, aware that further resistance was useless, now raised a white flag. As firing from the water ceased, Pike ordered forward one of his men to learn whether the enemy would agree to a formal surrender. Meanwhile, he himself helped an injured man to the rear, and returning to the edge of the clearing, sat down to await the British commander's reply. Now that the excitement was over, he felt exhausted. While his staff gathered round him to discuss the recent action, a soldier coming up from the rear declared that he had a British prisoner for questioning. Before the general could reply, a terrific explosion rent the air. A nearby British magazine, now abandoned by the enemy, had blown up, scattering rocks, timber, and debris for hundreds of yards. As the dust cleared, Colonel Pierce, who had been some 15 paces distance, found General Pike lying prone, and heard him exclaim that his wound was mortal. Indeed, a rock had torn a great hole in his back, and it was now plain to all that the gallant soldier could not live. Before he was carried away, Pike gave the command to Pierce, and, turning his head toward the soldiers gathering round him, weakly cried, Push on, my brave fellows, and avenge your general. The wounded man was then carried back to the Madison, and laid upon a cot, a captured British flag beneath his head. From shore there came to him already the shouts of victory, and he smiled at the thought that York was now his. The British had been routed. Pike died on the lake a few hours later, en route for Sackett's Harbor. Legend has it that his body for its preservation was placed in a hogshead of whiskey. At Sackett's Harbor it was taken ashore with stately pomp, placed in an iron casket, and appropriately buried. While flags were flown at half-mast, guns fired, music played, and a large procession marched. For some years, Pike's grave in the cemetery outside Fort Tompkins was marked only with a crude wooden slab. In 1819, on completion of Madison Barracks, the bodies were all moved to the new Post Cemetery. A large wooden marker was now set up to identify the graves of Pike and his military aide, Captain Joseph Nicholson, also killed in the same explosion. Unfortunately, the markers were neglected, and within a few years, the exact place of Pike's burial was forgotten. In 1909, the whole graveyard had to be moved again because of frequent floods. This time, the bones were reinterred about half a mile east of Sackett's Harbor. Of 130 bodies, only four were identified, and Pike's was not among them. However, his was probably the one body found in an iron casket, topped with glass and apparently filled with alcohol. On moving this casket, the glass was broken, and the body within, being now exposed to air, at once disintegrated. Some years later, the grave believed to be Pike's was identified with a small granite marker on a base of limestone rocks, and a bronze mortar bearing a simple description now rests atop the marker. As of this writing, the Colorado Springs Chamber of Commerce is seeking the removal of his body to the peak that bears his name, where a splendid monument is being erected. Although Madison Barracks is now surplus property and the government has consented to the removal of the bodies there interred, it is unlikely that the people of Sackett's Harbor will part with these famous bones. General Pike's been buried here for more than a century, says the mayor, and we mean to keep him here. The Battle of York was one of the first victories in the War of 1812, and may rightly be considered the third or fourth most important engagement of the conflict. Jackson's victory at New Orleans was more spectacular, but it occurred after the signing of a peace, and had no effect upon the outcome of the war. Harrison's victory at the Thames, October 5, 1813, however, outranks in importance the taking of York. Both Jackson and Harrison were hailed as heroes, and later attained our highest civil office. 
Pike, had he lived, might also have become a prominent figure in national politics. When news of his victory was reported in the papers, Pike's name was imprinted on the mind of every American. The press was filled with eulogies. President Madison paid him special tribute in an address to Congress, and a newly completed warship in Sackett's Harbor was christened the General Pike. On June 5th, Niles's register paid him a glowing tribute following a detailed account of the battle. His memory shall live and be with us many generations, and in the same issue appeared an account of a recent demonstration at the Baltimore Theater. Between the second and third acts of the play, the curtain slowly but unexpectedly rose to the solemn music and exhibited a lofty obelisk on which was inscribed, Z. M. Pike, Brigadier General, fell gloriously before York, April 27, 1813. To the left of the monument was that elegant actress, Mrs. Green, dressed as Columbia, pointing with her spear as she knelt on one knee to Pike's name, with an expression on her face that expressed all the solemn majesty of woe. As the curtain fell slowly to the floor, the people burst forth in one magnanimous expression of applause. On April 24, 1814, a board of honor of the 15th Regiment met at Burlington, New Jersey, and passed the following resolution. May the omnipotent hand which directs all things cause his spirit to hover around our councils in the field, and at all times be with his beloved regiment. They further decreed that on each succeeding April 27th, the regiment's standard should be dressed in mourning, each officer wear crepe, and no duties be performed. Since his death, Pike's name has not been forgotten. A French traveler in the West in 1818 found his portrait commonly displayed in frontier taverns. Ten counties in as many states and 18 towns and villages now bear his name, as also do two bays, three rivers, and at least four lakes. A number of states have erected monuments or plaques to his memory, and Colorado is now planning a new state park to be named for her first American explorer. So that's it for this episode about the great explorer and general, Zebulon Montgomery Pike. He did not claim the name of Pike's Peak for himself, but it was named in honor of him after his death at the Battle of York in 1813. The British commander at the Battle of York, Roger Hale Sheaf, had actually been born in Boston in 1763. His father died destitute in 1771, and his mother ran a boarding house in Boston that was occupied by the British during the Revolutionary War. One of the British officers, the Duke of Northumberland, took on Sheaf as his protege, and he sent him back to London to receive military training. Sheaf would then serve in the British military for the rest of his life. After the Battle of York, he was recalled to England, and his family settled at Edinburgh, where he died on July 17, 1851. This channel is called Unworthy History because we talk about actual history that is now deemed unworthy to show on history channels on TV, and because we talk about people who lived much harder lives than we have to today, people whose shoes we are unworthy to stand in. If you'd like to support the mission of this channel, then consider joining our Patreon page or becoming a YouTube channel member. Your contribution toward keeping actual history alive will be recognized at the end of each episode, and you will also have access to members-only videos. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.